AI is fantastic, but I think that most of what we hear about AI is hype. And uh, I won't talk about AI too much today, but that's the background of what I'm talking about. So AI is good, AI hype, you should be very careful because you're surrounded by it. This is the question. Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox says that statistically speaking, there must be many, many planets with civilizations which are more developed than our civilization. Maybe they have real AI on those planets. And um, the idea is that they will find a way of uh, creating interstellar travel by some kind of trans teletransportation or by I don't know, reaching the speed of light. And that would mean that there would be lots of developed civilizations, way more developed than we are, which are already observing Earth and maybe even in theory in Earth in one way or another. But then the question is, where are they? So there are lots of photographs of putative extragalactic events from the Air Force and so forth, but all of them, strangely, a very low resolution. So the Air Force has billions of images of, of phenomena in the sky, a fantastic re resolution, but every time it's something which might be an extraterrestrial event, the resolution somehow is never shot. And so we don't see aliens. So where are they? That is a question which has to be solved. I'm going to put forward hypotheses for answering that question. Now, other people have other hypotheses. <laughs> First hypothesis is there are limits to what we can achieve by means of our intelligence. So there are some very intelligent people, but there are no people and never will be people who are five times more intelligent than the most intelligent people today. Just as there will never, will never be people who are five, five times taller than people today because there are limits to evolution. And uh, it's very hard to enhance people's IQ. And it's reasonable, again, looking at the history of evolution and the biology of human beings, it's very tempting to suppose that there's, there are limits to our IQ. Now, maybe that's true for all civilizations, including extraterrestrial civilizations. Maybe they too have limits, and that's why they're not here. They couldn't build machines of the complexity and of the originality required to reach the Earth. Now, the second thesis, and this is what the book is all about, there are mathematical limits to what we can achieve using machines. So every machine, including a quantum machine, and there aren't any yet, every machine has to use Church-Turing computable mathematics. And that's been proven over and over again for every kind of machine. That is a very weak kind of mathematics. And that means that there are limits to what machines and by that I mean computers, of course, can achieve. And that, too, is universal. So this is a mathematical proof about computability, which is going to apply to computers on other planets. This is the book I mentioned. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the implications of these limits. There are also physical limits. So Moore's law is beginning to creak at the edges because we're dealing with tiny transistors where we're meeting problems in the physics of what we're trying to do. Everyone who tries to work in the transistor field knows that it's getting harder and harder. That's a limit which will also apply on other planets. And we're not actually doing very well. We have so-called autonomous taxi services. Fantastic. But if you look, they're not actually doing very well. One of them went bankrupt. They pulled out of the taxi business. And um, if you look very carefully, I didn't realize this, but all of those taxi services are not self-driving. They're monitored. And that means that what we thought, and this is after $100 billion of investment, what we thought were self-driving taxis are in fact self-driving only in a very limited sense. So let's go back to the Fermi paradox. Where are they? Well, they're stuck at home. They can't build self-driving intergalactic teletransporters because it's very hard and it gets harder and harder for them too. So maybe all of them are stuck at home. That would be a hypothesis which seems to be supported by the evidence, namely, we never see any of them. All right, now this is Nick Bostrom, who is a philosopher 
I used to be a philosopher. And he, he knows something about biology. He knows something about computing. He knows something about physics. But in every case, what he knows is toy biology or toy physics or toy computing. But he's very clever to utilize his toy knowledge of these things. He has the following argument why we are living in a simulation, why we are living in a simulation, or why the hypothesis is a reasonable hypothesis that we are already living in a simulation. And the, the answer, given his understanding of physics and computing, it seems plausible that there would be these advanced civilizations who can build simulations. So let's suppose that you are an oligarch, billions of dollars, you want to entertain yourself. The first thing you will do, of course, is to build a simulation of some planet, which may be they call it Earth, and see how the organisms on that planet evolve. So they'd simulate evolution, they'd simulate intelligence, and they would see what happens when the nuclear war starts and so on. That would be a kind of very, very elaborate, exquisitely pleasurable gain for a very, very rich person on some distant planet. We're living in that. We're living in the simulation that he built. That's what Bostrom says. And now, given our understanding of physics and computing, it seems plausible that there are already numerous simulations. There'll be lots of planets with lots of very, very rich oligarchs, all of them playing with simulations. Bostrom is crazy, but that's what he thinks. And therefore, it's likely, more likely than not, that we're living in one of those simulations. All right, now, the problem is, that, and that's what I'm going to be talking about now, he gets the physics completely wrong. And so because he gets the physics completely wrong, then we can't take his argument seriously. Now, actually, the worst case in this connection is not Bostrom. It's another philosopher. All right, this is David Chalmers. He's probably the most, world's most famous philosopher. So he's the world's most famous philosopher, almost certainly. Many people think he's the world's best philosopher. But now he says, we will before long solve physics. And he means if there's no nuclear war, then within his lifetime anyway. And on this basis, create a perfect digital simulation of reality. And then it, it's perfect. It's an exact copy of what we have already. Except you can twiddle it so that you live forever and you always have good food and you have eight servants and, and so on. You're very handsome or very beautiful. Or, and that would be good, wouldn't it? Because it's physically the same, but it's better. So he said, literally, everybody would want to live in one of those simulations. Maybe you'd go with their family. You'd all live in the same simulation. The problem is that you have to create a simulation of yourself in order to enter the simulated world. But I'm sure he has a subscription to the cryogenics offerings that you find on the web. You should never trust those because there's no way in which you can tell that what they offer is going to work. All right. Now, and he says he wants to come back every hundred years or so to see what's happening on Earth. Maybe to see what's happening to his kids or his grandkids. I don't know, because I think it's all nonsense. It's crazy. It's based on so many assumptions which won't work. Now, interestingly, our book is going to appear in the second edition. The publishers wanted a second edition for a number of reasons, one of which was that the book was being used as a textbook. And there are very few textbooks which express limits about AI. So most of the textbooks think we're already nearly living in a general intel artificial general intelligence world. The, the main heart of the book, which is the mathematical part, is about systems, simple systems, complex systems. And the previous talk shows how hard it is to do mathematics of complex systems. You can't make predictions about complex systems in the way that you can about simple systems. The brain, our human brain, is the most complex system that we know of. Orders of magnitude more complex than, for instance, the climate or, well, I have here the Hyderabad traffic system. All right, so there are two kinds of systems. The logic system, where we can predict mathematically what the system will do under given conditions. And that's how we build them. We design them using mathematics. And then there are complex systems where we can't make predictions. Or if we can, they'll be very, very approximate prediction. But we can't make the sorts of predictions which would be needed to build, to engineer 
an artifact which would have that system. Already now, this is Hyderabad, already now we can see that we can't engineer a simulation of the reality in which we're living because it contains all those brains. Every single one of those brains is such that you can't predict its behavior. The only way you can engineer an artifact is by working out mathematically how to predict behavior and then building an artifact to match those predictions. You can't do that with complex systems. That's why you can't simulate even just one brain. Even the brain of a rabbit or of a, even the brain of an amoeba, if amoebas have brains. All right, so the background to all of this is work which I've been doing with my co-author, Jobs Landgraber, which is about common sense in relation to physics and in relation to mathematics. So this is a paper. It's a very, very rough draft. Um, this is basically it's saying that the world that we live in is a world of common sense and the world of classical physics. But quantum physics takes us beyond the world that we live in, in interesting ways. So the world of common sense includes big objects like this machine, which works really well, and people and chairs and planets and so forth. But it doesn't include very big objects. It doesn't include very small objects, objects at the level of quantum phenomena, objects at the level of general relativity theory. I'm just going to talk about quantum phenomena. So classical physics, there are subsystems. You can uh, do experiments in classical physics in ordinary everyday reality. But we occasionally create special experimental setups. We do experiments in vacuum, for instance. That's still part of common sense, still part of classical physics. And now, when we move to the quantum realm, we leave classical physics and we leave the realm of common sense. And we can understand the world of common sense. You, you all understand what it would mean if I threw this in your direction. You knew that already from the age of three. It's innate. Understanding mathematics, you have to learn that. You have to, you have to acquire expertise. Understanding class, classical physics, you need to put together common sense and mathematics. And people do that. They've been doing it since Newton. What about understanding quantum physics? Well, we don't, we don't. No one knows what spin is. No one knows what a photon is. They don't even know whether it makes sense to talk about a photon because photons are statistical phenomena. They're not like people or chairs. You can't watch them. Feynman, who I think is the greatest of quantum physicists when it comes to what he was able to teach people about quantum physics, Feynman insisted over and over again we cannot understand quantum physics. And if you think you understand quantum, quantum mechanics he was talking about, then you, if you think you understand it, then you prove that you don't. So there's something very intriguing about this thesis that we can't understand quantum physics. And so, as I say, when we're talking of one photon, we're not referring to an element of a system, we're referring to a probability density. And well, well, we can move on. We're running out of time. So we, are, we can distinguish models that we understand, classical physics, models that we don't understand, much of contemporary physics, according to Feynman, and he was no fool. It's only the first kind of model that allows us to create artifacts, including simulations. We can't simulate quantum physics because we don't have a model we don't have anything like a model that can enable predictions, except in some very, very special cases of predictions which can be relevant to man engineering. We can make fantastic predictions about distant phenomena in the galaxy or about the behavior of Stern-Gerlach machines under these and those conditions where we shoot photons through them. We can make fantastic predictions, but none of them can be used in engineering. To engineer a simulation of ordinary reality is already really hard because there are things called brains. To engineer the whole of reality, it's nonsense. All right, so uh, the, the, I'll give you an example and then I'll stop. We can describe inter inter interactions between particles statistically, and we do this by appealing to quantum fields. We can model, model those inter interactions. So then are quantum fields a mathematical construct, which we use as a theoretical tool. 
That seems very reasonable when you see how they're used. Or are they a fundamental aspect of reality? And the answer that the quantum physics world gives, I mean, there are many. I have about 20 slides showing the different ones. The answer that they give in some is it's both of them. You can't understand that. All right, that's the end.